our next speaker giving his second lecture at this conference is Montgomery Childs, who's going to tell us about collaboration and science. He's got a lot of experience on this score, particularly as being the CEO of Altus. So put your hands together, please, for Montgomery Childs. Good morning. Let's see how we do this again. Okay. Cigar. Now, some of you see that I smoke cigars. I'm going to get back to the cigar, and we're going to talk about being sensitive to what nature is really doing. You also know that I sail. And that's our sailing mode. This is a racer. It was designed by Steve Killing, who designed America's Cup. It's not wooden. It's actually just a veneer, but it's a special design. Uh, we won the cup in Canada. A lot of flags. It's got a lot of, a lot of mast. But to learn how to sail and race at that level, it takes a lot of skill and it takes a lot of teamwork. You need four or five people. It has to be very coordinated. So we got a coach, and his name is Mike Wolfs, and he's a Canadian silver medalist, Olympic silver medalist. And so if you want to learn how to do something, you want to get the best people to teach you, if you can, somebody that's got a track record. So he's teaching us for two years. And there was one time we were out on a Saturday afternoon, the whole team practicing, and there's no wind. No apparent wind. And he says, Monty, it's easy to sail when you've got a nice breeze. But when it's like this, this is where the championships are won. And so I'm going to show you something. He says, anybody here smoke? Well, four of us put our hands up, okay? Hey, we lit up a cigar. We held the cigar up. He said, I want you to sh show you this, because the sails were just hanging straight down. So we waited for a second, and we watched the smoke just drift off to the port side. He says, okay, everybody off to the port side. Now, anybody that's into sailing, normally you're going to go on the windward side to counter the forces. But what happened was we get on the leeward side, boat heels over just slightly, the sails just slightly start to bag. And then they start to fill with the wind. And then we start to move forward. 0.1 knot, 0.25 knots, half a knot. And so interestingly, in 2004, when we won the championship, the day of the race, the first race, there was just a very late breeze, enough to get through the start, and then it just died. So we lit up a cigar. Everybody got over to one side of the boat. There's 30 boats in these races, and these races are 40 miles long. So we race across Georgian Bay. If you have an idea how big Georgian Bay is, it's about 300 miles long, and it's about 80, 100 miles across. Okay. So these are, these are big races, not around the mark, okay? And so for the first hour, that's how we sailed. And we left the rest of the fleet behind over two miles. We're not talking seconds or anything like that. And so that's actually how we raced. And we, uh, we took the cup that year because we learned to tune in to evidence and uh, see what it's telling us, which is really what we're doing with Sapphire, okay? So what I want to discuss is the difference between consensus or fact. So it's generally accepted uh, fact that the universe came into existence out of nothing. Now this is contemporary, so we have nothing. A guy like myself would ask, well, <laughs> how does it come out of nothing? But it's also a generally accepted fact as a consequence of the Big Bang, gravity is the genesis of all that we see. And this is all that we see. There's so a lot there, and that's supposed to be due to gravity, and that's supposed to be due to the Big Bang, and this, all this came out of nothing, randomly, of course. And uh, So it's a generally accepted fact that the core of stars became nuclear as a function of gravity. It's a generally accepted fact that black holes, dark matter, dark energy, and other dark things are responsible for making the universe work as it does. So we have a black hole, which is really nothing. They've never been measured. We have dark energy, which is another variable in a mathematical equation. And we have dark matter, which is also another variable in an equation to try to make sense of this universe that we see that came out of nothing. And of course, other dark things. So, <laughs> But it was also a generally accepted fact that you could not sail faster than the wind for thousands of years, until recently. It was also a generally accepted fact that uh, heavier-than-air aircraft could not fly to the last maybe 100 and 
10 years or so. So we have two worlds. We have the theoretical and we have the empirical. I'm an empirical experimentalist. <laughs> but like Newton, we don't deny the theoretical. We accept it as being necessary to develop ideas about what is going on in the world around us. I feign no hypothesis, and I contrive no hypotheses. I have not as yet been able to discover the reason for these properties of gravity from phenomena, which is his test. And I do not feign hypotheses. For whatever is not deduced from phenomena must be called a hypothesis or hypotheses, whether metaphysical or physical, or based on occult qualities or mechanical, have no place in experimental philosophy, which is, in today's day and age, you might say is the scientific method. So these two worlds have been at war from the beginning of time. You have the theoretical, which is in modern terms called philosophical methodology, and empirical, experimental philosophy, the way you go about doing experiments. So philosophical methodology relies mainly on a priori justification. It's relating to or denoting reasoning or knowledge that proceeds from theoretical deduction rather than from observation or experience and sometimes it's called armchair philosophies. While experimental philosophy makes use of empirical and experimental data. So you may say gravity exists, and you may say that the evidence indicates that gravity exists universally, but you may not claim that gravity is the primary driver of the universe. To make this claim means that gravity is the genesis of electricity and light, and that electricity and light are responses to gravitational forces. But there is no scientific data that gravity alone is a genesis of electricity and light. Do you have any water here at all? Oh, thank you, Michael. Is, it just, is this bath water? <laughs> it's genuine bath water, honey. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> So I want to get on to Albert Einstein because a lot of people criticize him. But what he had said is that all knowledge of reality starts from experience and ends in it. Propositions arrive at by purely logical means are completely empty as regards to reality. This is Einstein. Because Galileo saw this, and particularly because he drummed it into the scientific world, he is a father of modern physics, indeed of modern science altogether. But he went on another lecture in Oxford. If you want to find out anything from theoretical physicists about methods they use, I advise you to stick closely to one principle. Don't listen to the words. Fix your attention on their deeds. To him who is a discoverer in this field, and the products of his imagination appear so necessary and natural that he regards them and would like to have them regarded by others, not as creations of thought, but as given realities. So this is Einstein, and he gets a lot of criticism, but he did hold to another view, and he questioned his own theories. You need to know that black holes, dark matter, dark energy have never been measured. They're mathematical variables in mathematical equations that have been deduced. This may be acceptable as philosophical methodology, but it is not the scientific method and cannot be promoted as scientific fact. These claims have nothing to do with empirical science and are completely empty as regards to reality. It doesn't mean they don't exist, it just means these things do not qualify to be promoted as scientific fact until they can be measured and quantified as contributing factors to the natural process. And we do theoretical physics, computational fluid dynamics, and it's a tool, but it doesn't quantify what is going on in sapphire. The humble hydrogen atom. We have a proton. We have an electron. The electron has a negative charge. We don't know why. We suspect a proton has a positive charge. We don't know what that's about. We don't know why it is that positive and negative are attracted, but we know they are. And if we stretch the electron out from its orbit and it wants to come back in, it releases a photon. And some would say that a photon is a particle. And so I asked a physicist one day, so I said to him, well, if we excite a hydrogen atom 
and we can do it indefinitely. And he says, yeah, we can do it indefinitely. I said, so, and it's a particle. I said, yeah, and it, and it creates a photon. I said, creates a photon. I said, that's really interesting. So does that mean that the hydrogen atom has an unlimited supply of photons? Now this guy has got 83 papers published, peer reviewed. He was the editor of the IEEE, really good guy. But in that question, there was that three second silence that felt like an eternity, because he knew where it was going. So I said, does this mean that it has a limited supply of photons? I said, or does it create them? And even that was a silence, because what we're saying in effect is that when we excite the hydrogen atom, we're creating a particle out of nothing. Being an experimentalist, I'm cool. Like, I don't have to have the answer. And, uh, so we just left it at that. So questions in my mind came, well, if it's creating a particle of nothing, does that mean that when we create light that we're actually adding mass to the universe? So it's okay if you don't know. It's not okay if you think you know and really you don't. Knowing something is a result of conducting scientific method, investigating natural processes, so we collect data. And you do it all the time. You make decisions based on information that you have coming into you today. So it was a generally accepted fact that heavier than air aircraft could not fly. And we have the Wright brothers, and we know all about them, or do we? The Wright brothers, a couple of bicycle mechanics, they're not physicists, uh, they're not mechanical engineers, were inspired by what they believed could be. But instead of promoting theoretical postulations, they got to work testing, a lot of testing. And long before they were ready for Kitty Hawk, and long before they built Flyer 2 and the Silver Dart, they had, a lot of, uh, they had a lot of problems. Lilienthal, I think is the name. Lilienthal. Lilienthal, very good. So they had, at the time, what they believed from a theoretical perspective, quantified what it took to do flight, controlled flight, but flight. The Wright brothers used these equations and discovered early on, after they crashed and got bruises, that didn't work so well. So they got busy. They're out in the fields of Dayton, Ohio, watching eagles and other birds fly. And they're studying how they fly. And one of the testimonies is when they're watching the eagle fly, they're watching the, what I call the fingertips of the feathers, but watching them just move the end feathers a little bit as they glide through the ether, or the air, what they would call the ether. So they looked at the form of the wing, and they looked at controlled flight, and they got busy and they said, okay, enough of the crashes, let's build one of the first wind tunnels. And this is actually a picture, it's out of NASA. If you go to NASA website, they've got a real beautiful section on the history of flight. So they tested many different shapes and forms, and the speed of the wind, and lift, and the camber, and they devised their own formula and quantified what they believed would be the formula to give them lift and flight. And this formula, and there's variations of it, are the base formulas for all aircraft today. Now, they've been refined, of course, and I'll get into computational fluid dynamics and sailing and other things, but the more you discover through scientific method, um, the more advancement you can bring, more technological advancement to humanity. But you can't allow theory to box you in. So here's the first flight. It's amazing. And then uh, when they were done, they took it to France. America didn't really support them. They said, okay, we can't get funding to do this, so they took off to, to Europe, and there's a whole story about them traveling around while well, their sister was giving them uh, heck because they were starting to enjoy themselves too much. They enjoyed some of the French wine and things like this. But. So to prove their point, they started flying around the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> so we did it. And the age of flight began. Faster than the wind. Up until the last number of years, no one believed it was possible to sail faster than the wind. It was really hang up a sheet my goodness, the wind blows us and the boat's moving. And then people kind of devise different ways of trying to hold these sails up. And this is an artist's, I guess, rendition of the Santa Maria, which had a, a speed of about four knots, okay? If you do the calculation, it took quite a while to get across from Europe to the Caribbean. But with studying science and studying the properties of nature and starting to quantify them through testing, you can develop some pretty, pretty cool math so I'm going to play this. I think I can play this right. A little bit of both. So as you squeeze it in, off goes the boat. 
The second thing is the foils. You know, once we can lift these hulls out of the water, they're on these tiny little foils, and that cuts away a huge amount of drag. The foils are so small, and they wouldn't work unless the water was 800 times as dense as the air, which is the situation we had. So you really need uh, not much more than 1 800th the area of the foils to what you have with the wing. Once the boat starts to get going, it starts doing 10 knots, then the boat's effectively seeing 20 knots. So that sort of circle just keeps growing. You start accelerating, the boat goes faster, it sees more wind, it goes faster again, so you get more power, more lift. And this is a continual action, it's not just one squeeze, it's happening every second of the yacht race. The wind is coming from one side, the water's coming from another, and the yacht's continually being pushed forward. It really just powers itself up, and uh, the faster it goes, it just seems to lose more and more drag. If this was exactly 45 degrees, then the speed of my squeezing would be the same as the speed of the yacht. Now, the key to going fast is to bring this angle closer together so that for a, a little movement this way, which is the wind speed, you get a greater acceleration and a greater speed that way. So you make these angles finer. So I know it's a, it's a strange concept that you can go faster than the wind, but in these boats it's very easy, very easy to happen. And the question is, how fast? And the answer is as fast as you like within limits. Very cool. Too bad Christopher or some of the other sailors back in the old days uh, <laughs> didn't know what we know today. But from a scientific perspective, from an experimentalist and someone who does engineering and computational fluid dynamics and FEA and all these things, this is what you would call a design of experiments a nightmare. Okay? And the reason why it's a nightmare it's because yesterday I gave you a few of the factors involved. So the Wright brothers identified certain factors. They discovered that there were certain mathematical ways that they could quantify the camber and the shape and the area of the wing. The same thing happens in sailing, but sailing is actually even more complex because you have so many interacting factors at the same time. And what you want to do is you want to optimize the speed of the boat. You want to get as fast as you can go. So what are those factors? How do you quantify them and how do you change the design? So you come up with a design, and uh, well, as I was saying, these are just a few. There's a lot more. And you have to put them together in a kind of a recipe, you might say, and develop a design, a soft prototype, which is a computer model, which is what a lot of, uh, you might say, uh, theoretical physicists do today in the contemporary model. And, but you have to test it. You have to see whether or not it, it has legs, as we say. So computational fluid dynamics, and this is just one tool of many, and these are very powerful tools. So you look at the sailboat, you can put it in the computer model, and you can actually look at the laminar flow, which is the green part as it goes past the top of the wing, because this is a vertical wing. So you see some of the math came from the Wright brothers. So we have laminar flow, which gives you a low pressure system on the sail that pulls you forward. Then you have a second sail, and you look at the actual interaction between the sails. And then the next slide, well, when the boat starts to heel over, that actually changes all of those factors again. And then you have to trim the boat. So the models become quite sophisticated in that we can predict in one position or another position how it's, what its effect is going to be. Ultimately, those foils, they're like horizontal aircraft wings, but they're designed to go through water. So they're very thin. I don't know what they make them of, likely carbon fiber. But the idea here is that the laminar flow over the water gives the keel lift. And we experienced that with the Dawn Treader, like the boat that we had. It was a specially designed keel. We heel it over, and in light winds, the boat would actually start to come out of the water. So we decreased the drag. And that's a picture of the foil there. And it comes out of the water very fast and very high. So this one here is a world record.
He had a 23 knot wind, which translates to about 42 kilometers, I guess. And he top speed, I think it was 127 kilometers an hour. Whoa. That's the wind. So I figured it would take in Columbus uh, one, just a little over a day. <laughs> <laughs> and he would have been saying, it's fast. It's very fast. <laughs> So whether he discovered, you know, the new world or not for him, I'm sure he would have done it again just for the thrill. So this is where we're going to, I'm going to put a kind of stake in the ground and I'm going to say things that the experimentalists, they're the gatekeepers. They do hold the keys to progress in applied sciences and technological advancement. Experimentalists can't say yes to black holes and we can't say no to black holes any more than we can say yes or no to the EU without testing their models. So as Newton, the Wright brothers, Einstein understood, the two worlds need to be brought together. There must be a collaboration for technological advancement to be realized. You can't have one without the other. And I'm a true believer that science is to serve humanity. Humanity is not to serve science. Science is a very amazing tool. It's to serve us. So Sapphire, back in 2011, I did an evaluation. So when you're going to test something, somebody makes a claim, you go faster than the wind. You're thinking, well, okay. Or in Sapphire, you know, the universe is electric, the sun is electric. There's a few tools, modern tools, called design of experiments that you can actually filter through the hypothesis to see whether or not it may be a testable model or not. Because it's not testable, it doesn't mean it's not true, it's just we don't have the technology or the wherewithal or the way to conceive the hypothesis could be tested. So I did an evaluation, statistical filter tests and uh, analysis of variance based on Hertzsprung diagram and a bunch of other things, and came to the conclusion that if I broke the electric universe model down, I had two primary factors of charged plasma affecting matter of a different electrical potential. So if you have this delta between the two, kind of like the wind and the water, those are the two basic factors involved, and you start from there. So then I started to develop a model and looking at prior science, like Birkeland, Quinn, Fiorito, so many others that have been doing plasma. Most of it was cathode-centric, you might say. The electric universe model is anode-centric, so there's a bit of risk in there to say, okay, how's this going to respond? We didn't know how it would respond, but obviously it's, it's doing extremely well. But Sapphire is more like sailing in that we're looking into the way nature does things. We're not trying to force it. And Michael said last year, it's like, it's like breathing, it's natural. It's like we're not trying to push it and smash rocks together. And we're not using a large motor you know, to power us through the water. We're trying to work with what we see the plasma wants to do. We're trying to feed the plasma what we think or have some ideas as what it would like to do to become organized. And then we're monitoring those parameters. And that's how a design of experiments is done. And we get all that data back and uh, we can control it. I would say maybe a better would, would be to honor it. Okay. So we're not trying to get the plasma to organize. It likes to become organized under certain conditions, whatever that means. So Rupert and some of the others might have some thoughts on that. So we're not doing this. We're not trying to do something special. It likes to form these tufts. We don't understand them. But we're looking at them. They become organized. Their fields are uniform and that they like to be separated. As Michael said, some of the energy and the densities that we have, we'd say now are comparable to what we see with the sun. It's pretty amazing, actually. We're not trying to get unusual chemistry. Now, this is controversial. I can't really talk about too much at this time yet, how we got this. But what I can say 
If some of you are familiar with mass spectroscopy or residual gas analyzers, you'll know what you're looking at here. We started off with a chamber in pure hydrogen, and we baked it out for a couple of days. Then what happened is we said, okay, well, the chamber's clean, it's purged, we put hydrogen in, mass spec is saying, you have pure hydrogen in the chamber. I mean, 100%. We thought, okay, this is a great starting point. So in that, we said, okay, we knew that there's something that we could do. We introduced another gas, and we got our double layers to form. And then we just let it sit there and bake for a few hours. And it didn't change. It was just extremely stable. Then we thought, okay, well, we know that there's another thing that we can introduce, another gas that we can introduce that uh, will disrupt the double layers. Okay, they'll start to break down. So we did. But before that, the mass spec is sitting out here and it's reading only 100% hydrogen, even though we introduced this other chemistry. We didn't read any of that chemistry in the chamber. It only read hydrogen. We introduced the second, and the moment the double layers disappeared, we got this. And as you can see here, we have the top mass of three, 14, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 40, 30, uh, we have some other stuff as it's moving along, and it stayed there, and it was stationary. Like, it, was, it, it stayed there. What was interesting is that the hydrogen, the two other gases that we introduced, stayed at the constituent percentages that we put in there. So we, we registered those later on. It doesn't show on this screen here, but the percentages stayed the same. But the one element that dropped from 100% down to 39% was hydrogen, and all these new elements formed. Now, we're not making claims. We're just saying, this is what happened. And then, of course, is the barium and the whole titanium thing, which we know we didn't have in the chamber. So why it is there now on the anode or not, we don't know. And we don't know why the double layer shells organize. I'll just show you a little shot here, really. We have a tough job. We get to watch this all day. <laughs> So the temperatures in the, in the white area and the densities are some of the things that Michael was talking about and Lowell was talking about. These are very intense, high energy. That was interesting. We don't know what that was about and why it collapsed like that. But there's still the double layers around that. But all the energy actually became even more concentrated. It's one of those um, moments. We have colloquialisms <laughs> that we use. So we're not trying to trap high-energy photons and electrons comparable to the sun's photosphere, but it does. Another video again. This is a hollow anode. So in this case here, I will tell you that I'm actually putting deuterium and hydrogen as a mix through the core of the anode. This has been patented. So what we're doing right now, just so you know, if some of you that are into cold fusion have a hard time getting atomic hydrogen, sapphire produces copious amounts of it. What we do is we put the hydrogen into the hollow anode, and we have a special material in there that the anode is made out of. It dissociates the H2 to H, and because it's positively charged, we strip the electron, and we actually have protons migrating from off the surface of the anode into the atmosphere of sapphire. Just saying. <laughs> now, the genesis of this idea? Well, it goes back to 2011, when I was querying the EU to help me with my research, and they persuaded me to help them with their research, and while Thornhill and I are kind of going back and forth on Skype, and he says, well, I think that what we should do, and his Australian wife, is uh, we should have a hollow anode, and we should put hydrogen in there like the lighthouse and things. And so we got chit-chatting back and forth about the possibilities. But we didn't realize at the time what the actual response would be. I mean, it didn't occur to either one of us that we'd be dissociating H2 to H and then stripping the electron off of it. Anyway, it was through a conversation, chit-chatting, okay, which we do a lot of. We smoke cigars and drink a little whiskey and sit around the campfire and chat. And uh, what if? Well, that is what if, and that's a response of that. Now, you can't see it here because actually the exposure in the camera just couldn't handle. But inside here, you can see it with the human eye. There's a number of double layers in here. These are shells. The problem with photography is it kind of gives you a flat picture, and they kind of look like they're rings, but they're not. And... Um, you can't really look at them through the viewport because the UV is so high, you would burn your eyeballs out. These are some pictures of some of the things we're doing. So we're trying to sail. We're trying to learn how to sail. 
I'm trying to learn about the factors involved in sailing and doing experimental methodology. And that's what we do at Artists International. We're not purposefully smashing atoms together and then trying to contain these energies using high-powered electromagnets. The plasma itself creates its own containment field. The plasma wants to organize. The Sapphire Plasma Engine creates an environment that facilitates this happening. We are watching the smoke from the cigar. We are just trying to replicate what we think nature may be doing. And this goes a little bit of a history, and it goes quite a ways back. And uh, you may know these guys. I, some of you may not know James Hutton, but he was actually, Charles Weil actually uh, based a lot of his work on Hutton's work. And what it is, is uniformitarianism. And uniformitarianism is the idea that gradual changes over billions of years is the cause of all the effects that we see. Now, all these guys knew each other. And at the time, the church in England had a lot of power. What they didn't have power against is how to uh, counter their, their model, their hypothesis. Okay? And it became theory. Well, philosophical theory, but not scientific fact. So, Charles Darwin, Charles Weil, James Hutton, Thomas Huxley, Karl Marx, and other historical characters held to the view of uniformitarianism. And it's uniformitarianism that lies at the heart of much of modern science. And it's this idea that gradual changes over long periods of time is the primary factor of evolutionary development. It's uniformitarianism that lies at the heart of the Big Bang Theory, which claims gravity is a primal driver of the universe. So the problem that you have is that none of these things are testable. So the process of evolution is lacking because of sufficient factors to test. So in science, the first thing that we do is we take time out of the equation. We have to take time out of the equation. Time does not play a role in the initial evaluation. You have to have the ingredients. So if you're cooking stew or you're sailing, you have to have the ingredients first. And then you can take a look at how long maybe a chemical reaction takes. Now you can start looking at the time factor of the reactions or interactions. Okay? That's a fact. This is how we work. We don't look at time initially. On the other hand, there are those who hold the view that intelligence is the genesis of creation. But neither has anything to do with empirical science. As a matter of fact, the claim either is science, corrupt science. Science needs collaboration between the theoretical and the empirical. So I would encourage everyone to like, pull back the curtain, test it, see what reality it is. And with the feedback that we can give, we can, and we've been able to help the EU and ES help develop a more mature model. We don't make claims to this. These are things we give them facts and we won't tell you what they are to help Don and Wall develop their model because that's their job. That's not our job. So I'm very strong in giving credit to where credit is due, big time. Honor to honor is due. So pull back the curtain, be brave, leave the shore, and make wonderful discoveries. And that's really my talk. So thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. It's fantastic lecture, as always. I've learned a lot about sailing as well as about the electric universe, which is even better.